We all started off being only one cell large after fertilization occurred by the egg and the sperm from our parents. But now, watching this video, we are made out of a combination of trillions of cells that are different and have different roles and functions. We can describe this change in development of our cells through the lens of specialization. And we can say that the single cell we started off as was unspecialized, and the many cells that make us up today are specialized. So how did this happen? Starting off with the first zygote cell, it contained a complete sequence of DNA that is our genetic code. That cell split via mitosis many times, which is a process that involves copying the DNA, so that each new cell created also contains the same genetic code. From there, as the embryo starts to get larger, a process called cell differentiation takes place, which involves switching on different genes in different cells for them to develop into different types that carry out different roles. So one cell can be signaled to turn into a skin cell, where another cell can be signaled to turn into a muscle cell. Because all of the cells have the same DNA, the signaling of certain genes to be expressed and others to be repressed provides the context for each cell to develop into their appropriate differentiated role. This process is not random and is controlled by chemical signals passed to cells based on their location. So for example, if we have an embryo with a cluster of undifferentiated cells, Different gradients of chemical signals can be sent from the cells to determine their location relative to other cells. This will then determine the pathway in which they will develop based on the genes that get turned on. Creating a chemical gradient that signals this cell to be on the outside of the cluster, it can then be told to differentiate into a skin cell, which is ideal because we don't want to have skin cells forming in the middle of our body. We want them on the outside, as that is where they are supposed to be to fulfill their function. Stem cells are unique in the sense that they are the precursor cells that create all other cells within the human body. There are two unique properties of stem cells that you need to know, which include their capacity to endlessly divide and their capacity to differentiate along different pathways. Stem cells can, theoretically, continue to divide through the process of mitosis endlessly, which creates more identical stem cells. This is important during embryonic development as the early formations of tissues and organs are built, but also for adulthood because cells in your body are constantly dying and need to be replaced, and that replacement could come from a stem cell. In addition, because stem cells are undifferentiated, they possess the ability to be specialized into any other type of cell, as long as it is driven down that pathway. This is entirely unique to stem cells, as once a cell is fully differentiated, there is no going back. Once a stem cell turns into a neuron, for example, it is no longer a stem cell and is only, and will forever be, a neuron. The vast majority of our adult cells are not stem cells, as they are already differentiated to fit a specific function. But we do still have stem cells that stick around the body and divide when needed. A few examples are stem cells in our bone marrow and within hair follicles. Your body is constantly using and losing red blood cells, and when your blood cell count drops, it needs to be replenished by more red blood cells. Stem cells within your bone marrow will divide to create more red blood cells to circulate around the body. Similarly, if you pull out some of your hair, ouch, stem cells can repair the follicle, which will in turn continue to produce more hair. Both of these examples involve the regenerative use of stem cells that helps to maintain the adult human body. And there are many more examples that we could go into, like within striated muscle and skin cells. In any case, if stem cells are around and waiting to aid in regenerative repair of a specific tissue in a specific place, we call it a stem cell's niche. It will stay within that tissue and help in that specific way. If the stem cells are not needed, they simply are maintained within their specific niche location and remain as stem cells. Once they are needed, they are signaled to divide and differentiate to create specialized cells that perform specific functions to help cells and tissues at that location. Stem cells can be classified into different categories based on their ability to differentiate down different pathways. These classifications are called totipotent, pluripotent, and multipotent. Totipotent stem cells have the ability to differentiate down any pathway, meaning they can turn into any type of cell. This is the least restrictive classification, and we find these totipotent stem cells within early developing embryos that need the ability to create all cell types. It is only in this totipotent form that they can continuously divide, and it is the only form that is able to create an entire organism based on having every pathway available. The pluripotent classification describes a stem cell's ability to divide into different types that create tissues for the body. 
These have general names early in development, called germ layers, that will lead to the creation of all of your tissues. These cells cannot divide endlessly and therefore cannot be used to build an entire organism on their own. We need totipotent cells for that. As we learned on the last slide, some stem cells can stay in the adult body that support different niches. These cells have chosen a specific pathway based on their niche, which means they only have the ability to differentiate into a few different cell types based on the type of tissue they were committed to. These are called multipotent stem cells. The stem cells within bone marrow that we discussed on the last slide are a great example of this, as they have committed to becoming a blood cell, though they can still go down different pathways to determine what type of blood cell they need to become. As we move from totipotent to multipotent stem cells, their ability to differentiate becomes more restricted, because the cells are taking steps to eventually become specialized. The process of stem cell differentiation impacts the final size of a cell, which will also integrate with its function. Some cells are larger, like striated muscle fibers with a diameter of around 50 micrometers and a length that can exceed 100 millimeters. And some are smaller, like red blood cells with a diameter of around 7 micrometers and a thickness of only 1 micrometer. The final shape and structure of these cells relate to their functions, with striated muscle fibers being long enough to connect to bones and contract to become shorter in the process of pulling on them, and red blood cells being small enough to fit through capillaries and exchange nutrients in the process. No matter the function or the size, all of the cells originated from stem cells, and their differentiation led them to their final form. The cells in our body are different sizes which help them fit their role, but there is a limit to just how large a cell can be. This limit is true even for single-celled organisms, as we don't really see individual cells that are 5 feet tall, for example. So what's going on here? Why can't cells generally grow to be larger than what we can see under a microscope? The problem that cells have with growing is one of material exchange. A cell is wrapped up in a membrane that has a defined area, which is called the surface area, and all of the space inside of the cell within the cytoplasm makes up the volume. When the cell is a normal, smaller size, the amount of materials it needs to support the machinery within the cytoplasm of the cell can be exchanged across the surface area of the membrane. This is because the internal volume is small, and there is enough surface area on the cell membrane to support the movement of these necessary components. But as a cell grows, the internal volume of the cytoplasm begins to outpace the surface area of the cell membrane. With a large internal volume, the cell needs to exchange more materials. And because the ratio of surface area to volume is not one to one, in terms of growth, the surface area will end up not being large enough to support the exchange and keep the internal metabolism of the cell going. This concept of surface area to volume ratio can be visualized using cubes as a model. If we have two cubes, one that is larger than the other, and use this equation to calculate the surface area to volume ratio, we will see that the larger cube has a smaller ratio. And if we add a third cube into the mix, the ratio continues to decrease. The same thing happens with cells. If cells get too large, one option they have is to divide by mitosis, which will create two new, smaller daughter cells in the process, both of which are able to maintain balance and homeostasis. 